music. Welcome yes. home to Belfast. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask you, what's it like to be back home? It's always good to be back home. It's just never for long enough, unfortunately, you know, um, a few days here and there, but I'll take it. You take it. Well, let's look at the success of another state of grace. Mm -hmm. UK chart entry today, 10. Mm -hmm. Let's look at previous releases. Now, I've wrote some things down. Okay. Some statistics on right. 2013. Yep. All hell breaks loose, come in at 25. Yep. 2015, The Killer Instinct. Yep. Number 13. Yep. 2017, Heavy Fire. Yep. Number 6. Yep. Now, there's two bits of statistics put out today. Mm -hmm. That another state of grace is the finest album mm -hmm. Black Star Writers of Britain. Okay. Now, obviously the critics will have their say. They will always have their point of view. Sure. A few people have touched on, especially your vocal change uh -huh. to your previous bands. Now, uh -huh. one of the first things I want to talk about is another state of grace and the writing that went behind it and what influenced that album. Right. Before we talk about the vocal change. <laughs> yeah. Um, ah, what influenced it? The writing process wasn't hasn't been any different than any of the other albums. Um, for me anyway, obviously we've got the lineup change. I write the majority of the stuff in Blackstar Writers and I always have. I write all the guitar riffs, I write all the melodies and I write all the lyrics. And what would happen when Damon was in the band, I would get a song so far down the road and I would go take it to Damon and Damon would, would, would sprinkle his his magic on it, you know? But a lot of the riffs and stuff w w were me writing and I had agreement with Damon that we would split around 50-50 and, and, and that was fine. Um, but I don't need anybody to, to, to write songs. I'm a songwriter, that's what I've always done. I love writing with other people. I love being in a band where you take an idea in and, and you go, this is what I've got, and they go, ah, oh, it's great, what about, I, I, I actually really enjoy that. Right. But I don't need to do that, as you've seen in the solo stuff or whatever. Yeah. So, with this process, it was the same. I, I would get a song as finished as I thought it, 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 it could be, in my point of view. I would take it to Scott, or and this point to Christian, uh, Martucci, our new guitar player, and then Christian would add, put his input into it. And then there's three or four songs while we were making the transition between Damon and Christian, where I just finished them on my own because there was nobody to take them to. We were getting a new guitar player. So nothing re nothing's really changed. I just, I mean, I write all the time. It's, it's a job for me. And it's a job that I love. I get up in the morning and I'm home. At 6.15 in the morning I get up, make myself some breakfast, Check my emails because of the time difference in Europe and all that kind of stuff. Get my daughter up at, at about you know seven o'clock. Drop her at school. Maybe go to the gym. Maybe go for a run for an hour. Come home and work. Get my setup out. Get my guitar out and write. Even if I don't feel like it. Even if I feel I've got nothing, no inspiration that day. I work until it's time to get the kids from school. It's a job and it's a job that I love. But I have to, to me, I you have to treat it as a job, not just be like, hey, you know, I'm a rock and roll, I just write when I feel like it, and blah, blah, blah. That doesn't work for me. You know, I have to write every day, otherwise I feel I'm lazy, otherwise I feel I haven't accomplished anything. And the best part about it all is that there's tons of songs all the time. There's always songs on the go. So we're never finishing an album cycle where we have to go, we need to take six months off to go and get a house in the desert and find inspiration and, and come up with all these new songs. songs. It's like, Here's so what my, here's you're saying my, yeah, here, is record number five is already written. We're already, I'm already working on it, absolutely, yeah. you know, uh, um, because that's just what I do. I've been given this chance to do something that you love doing. I, dream, I dreamed of doing when I was a kid, and I loved doing it. So I wouldn't want to do it as much as possible, you know what I mean? That's what, the way I look at it, you know? Now, we did touch on it at the start of the question. Yes. Your vocal change yes. is dramatically clearly heard on sure. this record. Sure. Have you trained your voice to give it that Thin Lizzy vibe? Here's the story. When I was in the Almighty, very aggressive, very loud, very in your face band. Yes. And we were angry. And the way I sang suited that music. I was shouting, I was yelling, I was a lot of grit in my voice. And then when, if anybody knows any of my solo records, I, I, could, always, I, could, I could always thought I was a half decent singer. I started singing on them. I just realised I'm not the Almighty, I don't need to yell, I don't need to shout. Um, 
And then Phil was always an inspiration. I mean, even before I was involved with him, as he Phil was, was a vocal inspiration. Um, and obviously, learning the Thin Lizzy catalogue uh, as in depth and as much as I've had to to try and do those songs justice, it's kind of rubbed off on me. You know, it's it's part of you just learn. You're doing the solo acoustic stuff. You get better as a singer because you have to. You've nobody else get get in your back. You're up there on your own. Guitar playing, it's, but you just get better. It's like you know, it's repetition. I'm practicing every day. I'm singing every day. As I get older, my voice is getting stronger. Uh, I know what my limitations are, um, I feel my pitches get better, I just feel it just comes with experience. So for me, I'm not really singing any different than I ever was my whole life. I just know how to um, control my voice a lot better and I, I know, again, it's, like I said, what my limitations are, you know. Well, so when you talked about there your limitations, you have took another state of grace in my eyes as one of my records of the year. Thank you so much. Um, I have to say, you've released three singles uh -huh. from it. Now, yeah. I want to talk to you about Tonight the Moonlight Let Me Down. Aye. What influenced that song in that, your writing? That's a Scott Gormuth. You know, Scott was playing out in the dressing room one day, and I literally went, What's that? He went, oh, just a drum came up. Phone came out. He said, Play it again. I said, That's brilliant. I said, That's, that's a hit song. Played the riff, took it away. Um, Christian and I came up with, with the chorus and, and the rest of it and all that. And then, um, you know, I just I had the melody in the head. Because, I mean, the riff, the riff's a melody, you know. It's Scott's riff that takes the melody of the song. It's so strong. And um, I just was thinking, well, what, what, what are I about? You know, what, what, what am I feeling? And I remember I was talking to somebody, and I remember I used to have this wee Jack Russell dog. That's, that's what made you laugh. This is what the song's about. When I was about 10, and the dog followed me everywhere. And... Uh, I got knocked down the road and killed one day. And it was the first time I'd ever lost anything that meant something to me. Right, okay. You know, I, I never lost a, a human being close to me because I was only 10. But suddenly this wee dog that I loved it, it's, it's gone. And I never had to deal with that feeling before. And I just remember the overpowering feeling of grief and how awful I felt and the whole thing. So taking that and expanding on that going through life and you do start to sadly lose loved ones. Um, it's kind of a tribute to them saying, look, you know, I'm standing here, I'm staring at the moon, I don't know where you are, I don't even if you know, if, I know if, you, if you're anywhere, I don't know, but I'm thinking about you. You're talking to that I'm, person. You know, I'm talking to that person, you know, I'm still here, you're not around, you know, um, I wish the moonlight could bring you back, I wish I could see, you know, see you, saw, see you up in the sky up there somewhere, but I, so that's really right. So it's kind of a positive song, it's about turning, about tragedy and loss, but sort of, learning to come to terms with it, as you do, as you get older in life. So, talking about another state of grace and the up-and-coming UK mm -hmm. and European yeah. tour, yep. what are we, the fans, going to be treated to as regards <laughs> Black Star writers? And, I want to put this out there to the people that's asking the question. Right. Is there going to be Thin Lizzy songs? Probably not, no. Probably not? No. No. In fact, I'm sure there won't be. Because we're four albums in, and we're seven years into this. We're not Thin Lizzy, we're Black Star Riders. You know, the only reason we played Lizzy songs in the first sort of couple of tours was because we didn't have enough Black Star Rider songs. And it was always going to be the case that we kept this thing going that we would, you know, eventually. I mean, the last tour we went out, I think we just did one Lizzy song. And Thin Lizzy's Thin Lizzy, this is Black Star Riders. You know, and we've now got over 50 Black Star Riders songs to play. And uh, we can, we've got a very strong set together for the tour. Um, so I don't see the need to, 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 to play Lizzie songs, you know. So we're going to have a full Black Star Writer set list Absolutely. dedicated to your four albums that four are, albums are currently in circulation. Exactly. There's four albums worth of material there that, that we wrote and created that we, that we want to play live and, and, and we feel deserve to be heard live. Um, Thin Lizzie's Thin Lizzie's amazing, but Thin Lizzie's Thin Lizzie's a different band. So, as I say, so, for, so from 2012 to present, Right, you've got four albums. Right. What would be the favourite out of the four albums? Mm -hmm. The new album? Aye. Yeah, no, and for what reasons? Um, for what reasons? And I feel it's the most complete album we've made. The chemistry in the band I feel now is stronger than it's ever been. I had the most fun in the studio, not just making this record, but in 30 years of making records, it's the most fun I've had in the studio. And the best I've felt making a record. Camaraderie in the band was great. Everybody I thought played 
their asses off on this album. I thought they were all amazing individual performances. Um, I just feel it's the most complete. It's, just to get to this point, I just, excuse me, I feel the band's just firing in all cylinders, you know. Did Damon's departure have an impact on the record? Um, no. And I mean that with the utmost respect. Um, myself and Robbie Crane are quite pragmatic people. I'm leaving the band. Okay, see ya. Okay. We're not like, well, why are you leaving? Why are you going to leave for it? Oh, it's not going to be the same. We're just like, okay, we're carrying on. That's great. You go do what you want to do. We're, 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 we're just going to carry on. And, and that's the way we are about a lot of things. We're quite pragmatic about it. I love Damon Abitz. He's one of my best friends. But he, I could tell about a year before he told us he was leaving, I knew he was going to leave. I just knew the guy. I knew by his mannerisms. I knew certain things were coming up. Certain business decisions, certain things you do. I thought, I, I, I think I could, I could feel him drifting away, and his reasons for leaving are very personal, and I completely respect every one of them that he, that he wanted to. You know, wanted to spend time with his family. He wanted to, he wants to dictate when he can tour and for how long he can stay out. When you're in a band, you can't really do that because your manager comes to you and goes, "We've got a seven week tour," and everybody goes, "That's great. We want to do it." But one guy goes, well, "I don't want to be on tour for three or four weeks. That's never going to work." You know, so Damon's now in a place where he can do what he wants, dictate the amount of time he, he can tour um, and be in charge of his own career and that suits him. I love being on Blackstar Riders and that suits me and I, I love touring, I love being on the road. Uh, you know, the more shows for me the better and the rest of the guys feel the same. So it was very amicable and then Damon being the great guy that he was, he, gave, he didn't sort of say I'm leaving and, and leave the next week. He, you know, he stayed with us for a year till we found Christian, he played out the rest of the shows that were on the schedule. So we, 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 by the time he left, we were well adjusted to it. We knew it was happening, we knew it was happening for about a year, so it was like, okay, you know, we're ready for the next chapter of the band. And this next chapter, it's going to go into 2020? Absolutely. And uh, where will we see Black Star Riders headline in any festival? Yes, we've already been confirmed on a couple of festivals, which I can't, fortunately I can't say, but we're, We'll run a couple of very prestigious UK ones next year. Um, tons of festivals in Europe, uh, some US dates coming up as well next year, hopefully back to Japan, and probably another UK run at some point as well, I think, you know. So next year's all about just, you know, rounding the year out and promoting the hell out of the album. Because you've had a very successful career, you've Thank had you. a very successful touring career, Thank you. Uh, especially with Phil Mighty and sure. I.E. Black Star Riders. And um, this year, you took part in the 40th anniversary tour of Black Rose. Yes. At Steelhouse Festival. That's right. What was it like to play such iconic songs? Oh, it was unbelievable. It was just brilliant. Man. And how was the material received by was brilliant. the loyal Finn Lizzy fans? They seemed, they seemed to love it. I mean, it's such an iconic album. And I think we did it with humility and honour and respect that, that it deserved, as we've always done with Lizzy stuff. Um, and I thought we put on a hell of a show. I thought the band was great. Um, I love that album to death, and it was great for me to, to sing my Sarah and, and get out of here. Songs that we you know we've never done with Lizzie, and it, it was a couple of songs on there named Scots, I think I even played when when Phil was with us, you know. So uh, it was obviously a huge undertaking. It was obviously very nerve wracking. So obviously a lot of work went into the preparation of, of learning the whole album and, and doing it. But I think I think we put on a hell of a show. I really do. And I have to commend you on your vocal style <laughs> and how you have adapted to singing such classic Thank songs. You. And it really comes across in Another State of Grace. Right. I have to say, absolutely blown away. And quite a lot of people that I've spoken to, and especially for my site alone, we put out a review of Another State of Grace. Right. And it has been very well received. Oh, thank you. Everybody has clearly stated that this is the album right. that is going to set yeah. Black Star Riders. Fingers crossed. This hack. Fingers crossed. So, Fingers crossed. everybody, this is Ricky Warwick from Black Star Riders. Another State of Grace has been released. Please get your hands on it because it's a musical masterpiece. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. you very much. Great to see you, man. Appreciate that. That was lovely.